Hello, and welcome to the launch of the IEA's new Renewables 2020, 2021 Market Report. I'm Jethro Mullen, Senior Editor in the IEA's Communications team, and I'm joined today by our Executive Director, Dr. Fatih Birol, uh, by the Head of the IEA's Renewable Energy Division, Dr. Paolo Frankel, and by Senior Energy Analyst, Mr. Hamy Bahar, who is also the lead author of the new report. Uh, they're going to present the key findings of the report, uh, then we'll take a two-minute pause uh, for you to submit your questions, um, and then they will uh, respond to the questions that you provide. Um, on that note, for the journalists taking part in this press webinar, uh, we invite you to submit your questions via the Q&A function in the Zoom. Uh, you can do this at any point during the presentation, uh, starting now. And with that, uh, I'll hand over to our Executive Director, Dr. Fatih Birol. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, 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 dear colleagues, uh, dear friends. Uh, greetings to all of you from the International Energy Agency headquarters. Uh, last year, around this time, we have released our annual market report uh, for uh, renewables, as we do for all the fuels and all the technologies, and we came up with, uh, I would say, under circumstances, with uh, good news in terms of the growth of uh, renewables. And this year, uh, there were a lot of headwinds when it comes to renewables uh, growth, uh, one of them being the high commodity and uh, transport costs. But despite that, the our uh, market report uh, comes out with a very encouraging news. Namely, we expect that this year the renewable power capacity addition will be a record one, about 290 gigawatts, solar, wind, and other uh, renewables. This is, of course, very important, especially if we consider those headwinds uh, that I mentioned uh, to you. And this growth is driven by many factors, but uh, uh, when I uh, look at the uh, report that uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Baha, uh, put together with his uh, team, the most important driver is stronger government policies. And uh, here, many, many, uh, auctions around the world, several companies around the world uh, making uh, long-term uh, contracts for different reasons, including sheltering their businesses from uh, fossil fuel price uh, volatility. So uh, as a result of these policies and the, uh, the going into the COP26, many countries made uh, several commitments. I'm sure this helped the uh, momentum uh, as well. So as a result, we have seen this huge growth, 290 gigawatts. And when we look at the entire power sector, which we do at the IEA, we look at everything, all the fuels, all the technologies. When we look at entire power uh, sector, we estimate that this year, uh, close to 90% of the new installed capacity in the world was uh, renewables. This is, of course, something to uh, underline. Now, when we look at the future, uh, we look at the next uh, five years. In our main case, if there are no major policy changes, as which we hope uh, to see, but if there are even no policy changes, we expect about 95% of the growth of total power cap capacity installations in the world will come from uh, renewables. And here, uh, when I say renewables, solar plays uh, the most important role. Again, uh, some of the uh, colleagues following our work closely uh, might remember last year uh, when we uh, talk about our solar uh, numbers, I dare to nickname Sola as the new king of global power markets. 
And what we see that the about 55 percent, more than half of the all new power plants installed in the world will be solar uh, across the world, but driven mainly by the uh, emerging countries. All the countries renewable uh, installations increase, but again the lion's share goes to China and India. These two countries, these two giants, uh, account uh, about half of the entire global renewable capacity installations, and uh, China, especially driven by uh, uh, solar PV, uh, alone uh, provides about 40 percent of the global growth. Just uh, linking to the discussions on the uh, climate change, when I look at the uh, this very strong renewable numbers, uh, again surpassing the expectations of uh, China, uh, that uh, my colleague uh, Mr. Baha uh, gives me, plus the recently the good uh, Chinese numbers and the electric uh, vehicle uh, penetration, other clean energy technology achievements of China, I see that the China emissions may well uh, peak uh, before, well before 2030. So, which will be, of course, an excellent news for China, for the rest of the world, uh, keeping our uh, chances uh, wide open to reach our uh, climate goals, including the 1.5 uh, degrees. India is also growing very strongly. In terms of, in fact, uh, rate of growth, among all the major economies, India is uh, 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 number one. And the, our uh, forecasts for Indian uh, renewable penetration confirms that India is well in line with the 500 gigawatts target uh, that it was uh, set uh, uh, on the way to COP26 by Prime Minister uh, Modi, which of course another uh, good news for India and uh, for uh, all of us. Uh, these are all very good uh, news, uh, at least we think so at the IEA. Uh, but uh, there are a few points. Uh, one, one of our concerns is the high commodity prices. This is uh, creating uh, challenges uh, for us. And uh, we have calculated that if the prices, the commodity prices, uh, remain high, in the next uh, few months uh, to come, the, the cost decline we have registered in the renewable uh, energy may be uh, wiped out in uh, both for wind and solar. For wind, uh, we would uh, lose about uh, six years. All the cost declines we have seen since 2015, we go back where uh, we were. This is, of course, uh, uh, rather uh, uh, and pessimistic uh, news. And the same applies to solar. The uh, solar cost uh, reductions uh, will go back, would go back about uh, three years if the commodity prices remain where they are until the end of uh, this uh, year. Uh, having said that, even today, with this uh, commodity prices uh, we are uh, seeing, the renewable cost of renewables from a generation of electricity point of view is cheaper uh, than it is uh, uh, fossil fuel alternatives in most, if not all, uh, parts of the uh, world. A few words on uh, uh, biofuels. Uh, we also see that the biofuels, uh, they are um, rebounding about 8%. And this is uh, despite the commodity prices uh, here. And here, uh, one important uh, element is India. India uh, is making major uh, leaps uh, towards uh, to see a huge growth in uh, biofuels, and we expect it in the, within the next five uh, years. 
the uh, India uh, will be the third largest ethanol market uh, in the world, big jump, uh, just uh, after United States and uh, Brazil. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, my last two remarks uh, is the first one. Even though breaking a record, 290 gigawatts and the, about 90 percent of the global power capacity installation this year, uh, in order to reach our net zero target that the, uh, you may all remember uh, uh, May uh, this year we made our global net zero roadmap. When we look at the targets, uh, how much the renewable uh, 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 should grow, what is the pace of growth, we still need to double that uh, pace in order to be in line with our uh, renewable uh, 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 targets and as well as our net zero targets. Finally, looking at beyond renewables, renewables are growing very strongly. Electric cars, when we look at electric cars, says it is in many markets, very strong numbers globally. Uh, current estimates uh, are about 10%. Very strong growth of the, all, the, all the cars sold in the world, 10% is uh, electric cars, which compares 2019, about 2%, uh, big jump there in two years of time. Batteries, the cost of batteries are uh, uh, coming down, and uh, we see electrolyzer capacity increases also for hydrogen, very strong. So all these elements, the uh, renewables, what we hear from batteries, the electric car penetration, and the electrolyzer, uh, pace of electrolyzer growth uh, gives us one important hint, which we said uh, a few months ago when we released the World Energy Alert, namely, we see at the IEA very clearly, when we look at all the data, all the projects, all the government decisions, very clearly the very fact that a new global energy system is emerging. And it is very clear, and we at the IEA, uh, we are very happy to see that uh, new trend, to identify it, to support it, and as much as we can to lead it. With this, uh, I would like to turn to my uh, colleague, uh, Mr. Baha, to go through uh, some of the key findings of our uh, report. Mr. Baha. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rabiro. Uh, I want to go through now uh, with one of the key, uh, few key findings of the report, uh, just to summarize some of the trends that we see. The first one is on the exceptional growth. Uh, we mentioned last year an important trend that renewables are defying the COVID-19 crisis. They were resilient, uh, maybe even immune. Uh, and we saw that with the increase in capacity, an exceptional increase in capacity in 2020. And this was due to the mostly the policy deadlines in key markets such as China, United States, and Vietnam. Now, uh, we, are, we have new challenges, as Dr. Birol mentioned. Despite those new challenges and ongoing COVID-19 related issues, renewables will break another record in 2021. And uh, this record is an acceleration of capacity growth in Europe, India, Latin America this year, which will lead basically to a larger additions of renewables than last year. And this is obviously driven by solar PV, and uh, which accounts for the majority of renewables growth uh, this year. Looking at the future in the coming five years, we see an important step change. So 2020 marks a step change which will continue in the coming years to come. And we revised up our forecast mainly thanks to uh, policy improvements. Many governments announced new policies leading to COP which led us to revise our forecast than uh, previous year. However, there is another pathway that renewables can take, which is even faster. Uh, because despite the exceptional growth uh, last few years and what we expect in the coming, uh, uh, coming uh, years, there is an, another trajectory that renewables can take, which is significantly higher than what we see today. 
There are three important factors to achieve this. The first one is the removing policy uncertainties and the bottlenecks. Renewables need a certain policy environment where there is a long-term trajectory shown by the governments. Targets is first step, but taking these targets to an implementation plan will put renewables at a higher growth rate. The second one is grid infrastructure, uh, which is critical to connect renewables and integrate them. And the third one is increasing financing in the developing countries. When we look at the geographical picture, we see that renewables accelerate in all regions of the world, maybe not even all countries in the world, and compared to the last five years. The reason behind this is, as mentioned, is the policy improvements in most of these markets changing the pace of the growth that we see. And obviously China here uh, accounts for the almost 43% uh, of the entire capacity growth of the world, followed by Europe, United States, and India, which basically marks the fastest growth rate compared to the last five years, which is an important development for India. We expect major breakthroughs happening in the next five years. The first one is that we expect China to surpass four years earlier its announced targets uh, for 2030 uh, in our forecast period, basically in 2026, uh, which is uh, basically opening a faster growth possibilities for China. Europe, uh, according to our expectations, even in the main case, will surpass its current targets and preparing a good ground to, for faster growth under the new discussed uh, Fit for 55 targets. Uh, Europe is uh, ready to accelerate. And uh, United States uh, policy improvements and raised ambition and the competitiveness of renewables against uh, other technologies makes uh, an acceleration of the growth. Uh, in other developed regions, we also see a step change, such as in Southeast Asia, Latin America, Africa, and Middle East. This is mostly driven by a leapfrogging opportunity uh, from the, uh, to renewables because of the cost declines in, the, in these countries, which remains important, especially considering their resource potential. In the last five years, the trend in the technological development has improved significantly for solar PV and wind. And we see an important change over the last five years in the share of wind and solar in the global capacity growth of renewables, which was about 80%. We expect wind and solar PV to consolidate their position in the next five years, actually increase their share in total renewables growth uh, by another 10% uh, to reaching 90%. And we expect uh, 1,850 gigawatts uh, coming online, an exceptional 60% growth in the coming years. And this acceleration is driven by solar PV which accounts, as our executive director mentioned, uh, uh, accounts for 60% of the growth uh, of the coming years. With this growth, renewables actually account for 95% of the increase in global power capacity, uh, showing the world that uh, the pace of growth is significantly accelerating and uh, decarbonization is happening uh, rapidly in the electricity sector. Another uh, growth trajectory is also possible uh, in this case, uh, especially for wind and solar PV, depending on removing several technology-specific challenges. And for wind, this is mostly uh, related to permitting and social acceptance. And for solar PV, increased policies towards the distributed PV sector will help facilitate the growth in the coming years. This is important to mention that Non-wind non, uh, and solar renewables are also critical because they are dispatchable, but the policies have been very limited uh, directing uh, the growth of these other technologies. In our accelerated case, we see some of those policy improvements that they can basically lead to a higher growth of uh, non-wind and solar technologies such as hydropower, bioenergy, CSP, and geothermal, which are critical for the integration of wind and solar PV. 
Coming to the challenges after the great news, uh, we saw over the last almost two decades a significant cost decline of solar PV uh, and onshore wind technologies. Renewables were on the deflation side of the picture, were improving their competitiveness. However, there is a new challenge uh, coming up, uh, which we analyzed in detail uh, what will be its impact of high commodity and energy prices. Over the last few months, uh, the prices of key materials that are used in solar PV and wind uh, increased significantly. Polysilicon prices quadrupled, steel increased by 50%, aluminum 80%, and uh, transport costs increased by sixfold. This, increase ob this increases obviously impacts uh, renewables uh, costs. And if these increases continue throughout the next year, we see that both onshore wind and solar PV prices will increase about 25 to 30% and which is a different trajectory that many players were expecting over the last few years. And this will put about 100 gigawatt of renewable energy contracted projects in the recent months and years, which are not operational today, be exposed to these high prices. They may be in the risk of uh, delaying several projects, again, if the prices continue to remain high. Throughout this uh, commodity price increases currently, different parts of the supply chain is trying to absorb these cost differences, which is a very good point. But the continuation of this trend will limit this capacity of the companies to absorb these costs and uh, will lead to higher costs in the coming years uh, that we see as a risk in the forecast. Obviously, uh, this will ha lead to a higher uh, investment requirement for the same capacity, which we estimated about 100 billion uh, additional investment that will be uh, needed in the coming years. But important note in this uh, rather uh, uh, negative picture is that despite these price increases, renewables remain competitive against uh, fossil fuel alternatives, especially in the situation where we see record natural gas uh, prices uh, in the world. Policies remain, in this case, even more important than before for renewables, because if policies can reduce part of the risk on the, uh, on the regulation and administrative side, at least renewables can tackle these challenges better uh, in the coming years. We talked about the challenge now going through an opportunity uh, uh, here. Renewable stimulus uh, packages, as you know, IEA is tracking this very closely. We announced over the last uh, weeks an important report about this. We did a deep dive on the renewable component of the clean energy spending, which is about only 10%, about 45 billion US dollars. Obviously, this may sound small. However, this may lead to an exceptional additional growth of renewables if the policies are right to stimulate private investment. It can actually tilt the project's bankability in many parts of the market. And we estimated if the policies are right to support renewables, and if we efficiently distribute with the high participation of the private sector, we could actually see an important 400 gigawatts of additional growth coming to the market which is uh, an exceptional uh, rate that we can see for the acceleration of renewables. For biofuels, uh, moving into from uh, electricity, we see also important technological and geographical trends. First of all, uh, last year biofuels saw an historic decline uh, because of the limited uh, mobility that we saw in the world. However, this year they fully recover, actually surpassed pre-COVID levels which is good news. Although this surpassing 2019 could be even higher if the commodity prices were not that high as is they affect uh, biofuels significantly. But in the next five years, we expect a 30% growth, mainly driven by the growth in the United States and Brazil, 
but Asia actually is emerging an important market led by India and Indonesia and accounts for 30% of the growth. An important change uh, in the uh, geographical picture, we see Asia finally surpassing in 2026 Europe in terms of the uh, biofuels demand and becomes the third largest market. In terms of the India, just I want to highlight one important point is the situation where India is surpassing China and Canada in just uh, three, four years to become the third largest consumer of ethanol. This is driven by very ambitious government policies to, uh, to uh, diversify from the uh, fossil fuels using local sources. I'd like to finish with an important final message that our executive director mentioned, the pace of growth. We presented main and accelerated cases uh, to you today, which show a very optimistic outlook for renewables and acceleration compared to the past five years. However, still, this is not on track uh, for the net zero growth that we need to achieve if we want to go towards a net zero world by 2050. And uh, for renewable electricity capacity additions, the growth needs to double compared to our main case and for biofuels, growth needs to grow by quadruple, uh, actually more than quadruple, in order to achieve the net zero goals that we have. In this case, renewables will play a big role, but policy ambition, uh, increasing policy ambition is play also an important role in order to achieve this. The potential is there. We need just to shift the gear up once again. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for that presentation. Uh, we now have time to take some questions from journalists. Um, we're going to take a couple of minutes to review the, the ones we've already received. Uh, and uh, we invite journalists to submit any further questions uh, via the Q&A function um, in the Zoom. So we'll be back with you in just a couple of minutes. Thank you.
Hi, thank you for your patience. Um, we've got quite a few questions. We're going to try and cover as many of them as we can in the time we have left. Um, so first of all, uh, we have a question from Darius uh, Sneakers of Recharge News. He would like to know um, a bit more about the growth of onshore and offshore wind uh, in the context of uh, the record capacity additions that we're seeing uh, for renewable power. Um, and there's also a question on commodity prices. Um, are they really hurting renewable growth? Uh, and what are the risks? Uh, so those two questions, I think um, uh, Mr. Bahar, Hamid Bahar is going to take those, so I'll pass over to him. Okay. Um, so uh, very good question on wind. I'll start with that. Um, for this year and in the coming years, wind uh, accounts for about 30% uh, uh, of the growth. Uh, in the coming years, so uh, uh, following solar PV, which is about 60%. Uh, the important news is that there's an emerging offshore wind market uh, that is growing very fast. We expect in our forecast uh, offshore wind uh, market to uh, triple uh, in the coming years by 2026. And uh, by 2026, actually, offshore wind market will account for 20% uh, of all uh, renewable, all uh, wind capacity growth. So it's a sizable market from 5% uh, today. What is driving this uh, is a different regional change. Obviously, Europe remains a large market, but the growth is moving outside of Europe, mainly to Asia. Uh, China uh, is, uh, is an important emerging market uh, for offshore wind, uh, but also Japan, Korea, but also <clears throat> we see a new capacity growth in the United uh, States. Uh, related to the uh, commodity prices, uh, I will leave it to the executive, no, I will continue. Uh, so the, for the commodity prices, there are risks. Uh, we see an important risk for uh, especially smaller developers who cannot absorb the cost increases uh, like the large companies, large developers that they can. So it's an important uh, risk for them. Uh, but also, uh, many companies uh, uh, won auctions, renewable energy auctions, uh, thinking that renewable cost will continue to decline in the coming years, uh, which, which has been the trend over the last decade. Uh, considering this, it is important to, uh, to highlight that uh, there is a risk for these contracted projects. Now, uh, these developers are using the contractual arrangements with the suppliers to, uh, to basically shelter uh, themselves for these increases. But as we mentioned, the continuation of this increase uh, through uh, 2022 uh, can lead to uh, another story, uh, which we see in rising uh, investment costs and investment uh, for the same uh, amount of uh, capacity, bringing uh, several uh, uncertainties. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Baha. Um, so we have quite a few questions from different journalists about uh, policies, which is great because we, we love policies at the IEA. Um, Rolf de Vos, uh, an independent journalist from the Netherlands, is asking um, which type of government policies have been most successful for boosting progress, um, and also what do governments need to do to achieve uh, a net zero pace of growth. Uh, and we also have a question from Florence Chong of, of, of IPE, which is similar. What are the key government policies that are incentivizing the development of renewable energy? Um, how important are subsidies? Uh, so I think uh, Dr. Birrell is going to take that question. There are a couple more for him um, because we've got quite a few. Uh, one from Noah Browning of Reuters. He'd like to know, um, he says, Dr. Birrell, the CEO of Shell, recently told investors that the oil and gas industry is now investing at levels that are compatible with the IEA uh, net zero emissions by 2050 scenario, uh, but that the decline uh, in demand for these fuels was not going down in line with the IEA outlook, but going up. Uh, do you agree with that assessment? And then the last question from Camilla Neshert uh, of S&P Global. Um, do you expect the current power market volatility to increase demand for renewable PPAs by corporates and industrial, sorry, PPAs as uh, power purchase agreements? Uh, do you expect uh, volatility to increase demand for these uh, by corporates and industrials in the coming months and year? Um, so, yeah, three questions for, for Dr. Birrell. I'll pass the microphone over to him. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mellon. Uh, first of all, what kind of policies could uh, further support uh, renewables? 
I think, as I said in the beginning, uh, the success story, uh, today's success story is basically uh, driven by the long-term uh, visibility that the governments give to uh, investors. And here, uh, I would say, uh, the auctions uh, seem to be uh, one of the key, op uh, key options uh, we have. Second question, in addition to uh, renewables, what other policies uh, we need to reach our net zero targets? At the IEA, we think all clean energy uh, technologies uh, are uh, important, especially in the next 10 years. We need to see a massive expansion of the clean energy options, renewables, uh, energy efficiency, uh, electric cars, uh, and in the countries where it is accepted uh, nuclear power. We have to make a major, massive uh, expansion of those in order to keep our chances to reach our climate uh, goals and to hope to see that with the innovation of new technologies ranging from hydrogen uh, to different carbon capture technologies are coming around 2030 and uh, helping the uh, existing technologies. The question about the Shell uh, CEO, uh, uh, Ben van Burden, saying that the, uh, the investment in oil and gas industry is in line with the IEA net zero uh, strategy, but the demand is not. It is absolutely uh, true. According to our uh, net zero uh, uh, strategy, oil and gas upstream investment should be about uh, 350 billion uh, US dollar. And uh, today what we see is around that uh, level. But we see a huge growth of oil demand as a, is important, as a, a rebound from the uh, uh, big uh, drop last uh, year uh, we have seen during the COVID. But we also think, uh, dear colleagues, that the, if the uh, countries would uh, implement what they said they would in their uh, NDCs, nation determined contributions, we may well see oil to peak around 2025. And these NDCs are uh, definitely not a 1.5 degrees uh, temperature uh, trajectory, higher than that, but even the current indices would lead to uh, uh, oil demand peak around 2025, which is mainly driven by the penetration of uh, electric cars. And the last question, the volatility in the uh, energy markets today, uh, how would it affect the uh, uh, renewables? I think the, uh, what we see, for example, natural gas uh, uh, prices spiking up in Europe six, seven times higher than what we have seen before, the, uh, uh, before uh, this uh, price uh, spikes is uh, definitely not a good news for the economy, but not a good news for the natural gas industry as well, producers, in my view. Natural gas has been uh, presented us uh, by the natural gas industry as a, a reliable, affordable, and a cleaner energy source to uh, accompany uh, the renewables clean energy technologies. But the recent very high natural gas prices spikes and the volatility. Uh, when I look at uh, uh, those trends, I think natural gas industry did not get good marks uh, from millions of consumers around the world. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised that this uh, volatility in the markets uh, would give an additional boost to uh, renewable, but not only renewable, but other clean energy technologies. And uh, I would even think that the uh, nuclear energy may well uh, see a comeback as a result of the energy security energy price and volatility, what we are seeing uh, around the world. Yes, volatility and the insecurity of the uh, fossil fuel uh, supplies can give additional uh, momentum to renewable and other clean energy technologies.
Thank you very much, Dr. Birrell. Thank you to our uh, renewable energy experts um, for their presentation. Um, thank you to the journalists for your questions. And of course, thank you to everyone following this event uh, for your interest in our work. Um, the full Renewables 2021 report is available for free on our website, so please do go take a look. Um, the online version of the report also includes some specially designed uh, data browsers, so you can go deeper into the numbers. Um, if any journalists have additional questions that didn't get covered uh, in the Q&A, we apologise for that. Please get in touch with the press office. Uh, our next uh, date in the diary um, uh, in the coming weeks is our coal market report, which will be released on the 17th of December. Uh, we look forward to you joining us again for that. Uh, and that concludes our press conference. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you.